Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. Well, we are um, experiencing a great excitement times for the treatment of uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, thanks to the incorporation of uh, new drugs in the last uh, couple of years, the world of uh, CLL therapy is uh, changing, really, as we speak, right? So how we incorporate these uh, drugs is pretty much dependent on the data that they are being um, done and study in really good clinical trials. So. We will say that the, the most uh, exciting uh, drugs that has been approved, at least for frontline, is, are the second generation anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, and I have to really mention obinutuzumab and ofatumumab. Both of them has been combined with chloramucil and compared with chloramucil alone or with rituxan chloramucil, and both are showing a really good benefit. I will have to say that the data with obinutuzumab, chloramucil are really, really excited. And of course, we cannot compare clinical trials, but also the ofatumumab uh, chloramucil show significant uh, benefits. Um, considering uh, the incorporation of the BCR inhibitor in the therapy for CLL, I have to mention the new um, indication for 17P deletion of TP53 mutation CLL patients, who is really, really an unmet need for patients who are most of the time intrinsically refractory to fludarabine or to chemotherapy regimens, right, or historically are not being responding quite well. So having a BCR inhibitor as uh, ibrutinib, that is the one that has been approved for the indication, really, really uh, represent a, a very, very um, great advancement for the therapy of this patient that otherwise they don't have uh, much of opportunities. Overall, how I treat uh, newly diagnosed or patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia that require frontline therapy, as uh, NCCN uh, guidelines really state, I pretty much pay attention to the cytogenetic risk assessment as well the IGBH mutational status, and finally the age and the performance status, including comorbid condition of each patient. Based on these characteristics, it's very easy to differentiate to younger patients versus older patients, high-risk patients versus low-risk patients. And in this regard, everyone has a slightly different approach in these uh, patients, but I will say that in a younger patients who has a low-risk cytogenetic and IGBH mutated immunoglobulin, surface immunoglobulin, I think there's still um, very good data coming for the CLL8 uh, trial from the German trial as well from the MD Anderson data who support the use of uh, fludarabine, cytoxan, rituxan as we have seen over time that it's a group of patients who may do very well even after seven, eight years with very, very prolonged PFS and survival. Um, I will have to make a reference, of course, uh, the most common population that we treat with CLL. I was referring to the younger and fit patient. Unfortunately, we know that it's only a fourth, one-fourth, or one-third, I would say more than one-fourth of the patient with CLL. Most of our patients with CLL are more than 65, and most of them, as we now for many, many works, they have multiple comorbid conditions, they have decreased creatinine clearance, and really they don't have a perfect performance status. So we need to really adapt new therapies to this important population of patients. In this population of patients as a frontline therapy, the combination bendamastin rituxan has been quite popular and has really significant benefit. However, the incorporation of the monoclonal antibodies such as obinutuzumab plus chloramucil and ofatumumab plus chloramucil, both of them incorporating the NCCN guidelines, offer significant benefit for patients otherwise not really eligible for intensive chemoimmunotherapy approaches. In considering frontline therapy, so if, for example, a patient develops an indication to start treatment, they've developed anemia, which by the staging criteria puts them in a high risk category. In those patients, it's then time to start treatment and have a discussion and plan for treatment. In terms of the treatment approach for the first therapy, 
Um, things are evolving. They're probably going to be different in three to six months from now than what I'm telling you right now um, because of the new small molecule inhibitors that we have and uh, data that's emerging um, as we speak, actually. The standard today is um, determined by a patient's age um, as well as by chromosome abnormalities, particularly the 17P deletion or presence of the 17P deletion. So with regard to age, we make a distinction in terms of patients who are in the elderly patient category or the younger, more fit patient category. 65 has been used in clinical trials and in the liter it's reported in the literature. It's a general guideline for the cut point between the elderly population and the younger population, but it's not a hard, fast number. And there are patients who are in their 70s who physiologically are less than 65 years of age, who, would I con who I would consider for the more aggressive therapy. So you have to individualize based on a patient's characteristics and um, how they are f in terms of their fitness and their overall physiologic condition. So in terms of the older population, the standard of care today is uh, a chemoimmunotherapy combination of chlorambucil and a CD20 antibody. Now, there are three different CD20 antibodies that are available. All three have been evaluated in the frontline setting in combination with chlorambucil. All three have activity, which is better than chlorambucil by itself. And one could, one could argue that all, any three of those CD20 options would be a reasonable option as a frontline therapy uh, for frontline treatment of, uh, of the, in the elderly uh, population. We can talk a little bit about the difference between the CD20 antibodies um, uh, later. Um, so chlorambucil plus the CD20 antibody for the elderly population is a standard of care. There is a new trial that's going to be presented at ASH this year, which is a randomized trial of chlorambucil versus ibrutinib. Their press releases have indicated that that's a positive study favoring the outcomes in patients who have been, uh, who have received the ibrutinib monotherapy. So we anticipate that in the near future, in the next few months, based on those data, that ibrutinib will receive a frontline indication uh, monotherapy. Uh, and so probably that will replace the chlorambucil plus the CD20 antibody, at least in the frontline setting. Generally, I divide my approach to initial therapy amongst young, fit patients, older, less fit patients, and 17P deletion, which is our highest risk abnormality. There are some subdivisions there. For the young, fit patients, FCR chemoimmunotherapy remains the standard of care. The German CLL study group just performed the CLL10 trial, which randomized young, fit patients between FCR and BR, and this did show a clear progression-free survival benefit for FCR over BR, particularly in the younger subset of patients under age 65. <coughs> Furthermore, we now have long-term follow-up data from the MD Anderson as well as the German CLL study group, which demonstrate that it appears that there's a plateau on the progression-free survival curve for FCR out at 10 plus years. Namely, about 40% of patients are still in remission, and many of them are MRD negative. This suggests that a subset of patients may actually be being cured by FCR. Furthermore, when we look at who these patients are, it turns out that the group with the most benefit are those with the lower risk mutated IGH who do not have high risk cytogenetics like 17P or 11Q deletion. So particularly for these mutated IGH patients who are young and fit, FCR clearly remains an important standard of care with 60% of them in long-term remission. There's no evidence that BR can result in any plateau on a progression-free survival curve. I don't consider it an appropriate alternative for this patient population. For the deletion 17P subgroup, this patient subgroup is resistant to chemoimmunotherapy and has had poor outcomes with any of these previously discussed regimens. And Abrutinib, the BTK inhibitor, has been approved for both frontline and relapse use in 17P-deleted patients, and that would be my first-line 
choice for them. There is actually relatively limited upfront data from mostly one study done by the NHLBI, which did show significant activity in 17p deleted CLL in an upfront setting. Adelis of rituximab also has some activity and was approved in the EU for upfront 17p deletion, although not in the United States. But its overall toxicity profile in the upfront setting is more difficult to manage than a brutinib, and that would lead me to favor a brutinib.